All right, welcome back to the True Geordie podcast. It is the most talked about documentary in the world right now. One of the biggest documentaries of all time. We are lucky enough to be joined by one of the stars, one of the main characters. It's Bhagavan Antle, also known as Doc. Hi, Doc. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing good. How are you today, dude? I'm fantastic, mate. Thanks for joining us. I can't quite believe this. You guys have turned into... uh, It's almost like you're not real. Even though you're real people, it feels... Because of the way they did the documentary, you guys feel like scripted actors. Um, You know, how's it been the last couple of weeks? You know, it's a salacious, outrageous ride. Tiger King is, you know, not a documentary, but it is this incredible, crazy time It has exposed us to a much broader market in some ways, which we'll get to probably just ridiculously uh, famous for things that aren't true. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in other ways, it just exposes uh, people to the bigger picture. I think it lets people know more about big cats because tigers are in desperate need of help the worldwide. And we hope that this brings attention to their plight which is the only thing important that came out of it. So I noticed that uh, Carol Baskin's husband did a little video where he said that they'd give him this speech before you agreed to be in the documentary about how they were going to make the blackfish of tigers. Did you get the same speech? Well, I got a speech similar. I was told, hey, we're going to make this show. They're going after your heartstrings. So I was told, hey, we're going to make a show about your international conservation work because I have great projects around the world I have a ranger station. I operate in the deep jungles of Sumatra. I've got my rangers there. We travel there. We've come tons of funds into it. They said, we're going to document how tigers in America are saving tigers in the wild. Because that's what I live for. And they poured that in my ear, telling me, oh, you're going to have this what you want, exposure for your tiger conservation program. They told her that, you know, she's going to do that stuff about the blackfish, which is absurd because it doesn't equate to the same thing. And I'm sure her husband got out there and said whatever he was supposed to because she's going to pour sardine oil on him and feed him out if he doesn't straighten up. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, we'll, okay, we'll definitely get on to that. Definitely. But, um, you know, in the first episode, take, take me back almost to as you're watching it. I'm assuming you watch it on Netflix when we did. They open up and they say, uh, these guys are backstabbers. These guys are bad people. They, they don't even give you a time as an audience member to make your own mind up. What was it like being a part of that, watching what they were saying about you instantly before you'd even been shown? I mean, it just looks like outrageous slander, right? That they're just trying to paint a picture of some crazy salacious sensational idea to lock people in that something outrageous is happening mm-hmm. and something outrageous did happen show is just what i described in there he is a wild drug using homosexual dude that just is on fire <laughs> i got nothing against any of his personal choices or his personal choices but he's outrageous to a fault and carol's is creepy and as weird as a person gets seems like a serial killer which maybe she that's wild stuff so to combine them they just threw me in so they could take the ritz carlton of big cat facilities and try and tie it in somehow Mm -hmm. and they were grasping at any straw they could get to create drama when the producers were here hanging out they were filming and talking to me uh rebecca said so many weird things to me while we were making this conservation program about lifestyle and girls and stuff going on. I thought she was hitting on me or something. She asked me such weird stuff. And I said, dude, uh, to Eric, I said, that chick can't come back again. And I threw her out. I said, I don't want to see her again. Something's wrong here. But I was too fanatic on running my conservation program and getting this message out. that I allowed them to come back for years without her and tie me into this insanity that became the crazy ride of Tiger King. Tell me, just going back to the tigers, what is it like to look in the eyes of a tiger? I've never done that before. What does it feel like when you do that? It's something I wish everyone had the chance to do because I think it would give you a deeper connection and a more profound experience of nature in its most raw form. A tiger has such a presence. One, it has what I call God's greatest paint job, that outrageous striped face, which is just hard to believe it's meant to look that way. Mm -hmm. And then it is just a purveyor of death. This is a guy that is eight feet tall, weighs 600 pounds, has a 10-inch arm span, and he's got 10 knives embedded into his hands. 
he's way past Wolverine. Mm -hmm. And that's who he is. And he can deal in love and kindness or death at the twitch of an eye. And so he's this guy that's super cool, but also incredibly intense. Most of the time, tigers are caring. They get along very well with each other. They have this really neat social dynamic. Mothers raise their kids and can get along with them well. So they've got this way of they bond with you and they make this exchange. That tiger looks at you very lovingly. Tigers do what's called the long blink. When they're at, when they find something infatuating or they find that they want to show emotion, they stare into your eyes and they open and close their eyes very slowly. And that's the long blink. You can see them doing that to you and being around. It is a rush like no other of this connection to nature that's just unbelievable. At one point, we've seen you entering on an elephant, and, and that made me question, of all of these animals that you have, which one of them would you be like, I don't want to be on my own with that one too long? Is there any of them which you're like most a bit scared of? No, I'm not scared. I grew up a professional cowboy with 500 horses and 10,000 cows. I worked in rodeo. I worked out there in the wilds, sleeping, eating, and breathing with my horses and my I'm six gun on my hip, real pro cowboy in the 1960s. My dad is John Wayne. Everything John Wayne did in a movie, my dad did in real life. Plus, plus. Mm. He was an extreme character. So I just have a lifestyle that's generated for me an opportunity. I've met tigers that I don't want to interact with, mm -hmm. and those tigers I don't interact with. But I've met more than 100 that are incredibly charming and are just waiting for the opportunity to go for a walk, to go for a swim. They love adventure. They'll come right out and stick right to your hip and are incredible guys. You look at my Instagram today. There's a great picture of my son with a huge tiger walking along. My son replaced me as the living Tarzan guy here because he got big and I got old and fat. And uh, he's out there cruising around with that, those huge tigers at his hip, diving in a pool, letting them swim with him. That lifestyle is something that you can have if you learn the language of tiger just like walking what i say here in the states i'm sure that's equivalent there maybe the same thing in england you walk into a bar full of hell's angels it's a dangerous situation if you say the wrong thing and do the wrong stuff you might cross a line intentionally or unintentionally that could get you killed that is what it's like to be around tigers if you're one of the angels and you come in you're greeted with uh, sure, love and understanding and camaraderie. That's how it is for me to be with a tiger. I'm part of the team tiger, and they always are waiting for me to come around and have the next interaction. That's really well explained, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, there was one moment in the show, we obviously seen the girl losing her arm, which was awful. She clearly wasn't speaking the right language that day. Um, but have you ever seen a moment or felt a moment yourself where you thought, I, I am in the most trouble is there one moment that st stands out for you or has it has it because i can't believe it's been plain sailing this entire time surely <laughs> you know again i guess it's probably like riding a motorcycle you know i certainly love a harley i've been out on one going way over 100 miles an hour mm -hmm. and it's an incredible thrill and i've had fools pull on to the road while i was being a fool on the motorcycle going too fast and gone Oh, no, and you re group and you miss. <laughs> okay, okay. That happens with tigers. Sometimes they reach out, and they say, that's mine. And cha-ching, out come blades as big mm. as your fingers. And they reach out and say, snatch. And it goes right past you because if they catch another tiger across the face, it stings. If they catch a person across the face, it comes off. Right. So I have felt the breeze before, and that has been – outrageous i've had it hit me and tear my shirt off and barely harm my skin um from that right timing you got to learn to dodge and move at the right time oh, my, my son calls you got to juke i got to juke out the way and he he's master at it and i've had my time with it you must be like floyd mayweather by this time yeah uh i know floyd and, and, and floyd is magical i don't know that i am quite as outrageous of reaction time as yeah. Floyd, but it's certainly been my goal in life as I've done this for 40 years almost yeah. now. You know, I had to, had so many 
incredible times with giant tigers. I've seen you've had a lot of celebrities speaking of Floyd. Uh, I've seen you had The Undertaker there recently. Um, uh, is there any names that people might recognize who uh, come around? Well, Beyonce's been around. You know, you guys, great pictures of her hugging my, my son that's a chimpanzee. When he was young, you can see Beyonce hugging on to him. He met Blue Ivy and, you know, played around there. Jay-Z came and petted tigers and hung around. I, I could drop names on you for an hour. <laughs> I also spent nine months with Jim Carrey making Ace Ventura. I stayed months with Dude. Eddie Murphy making him into Dr. Doolittle. You know, I stayed with Bill Paxton making Mighty Joe Young, yeah. having Bill become that character that's trying to get the vibe of how he's this wildlife guy. He's emulating me. He told me straight up. I'm watching you, and that's who I'm going to try and be in the show. What is the most simple reason for Tigers being so depleted? Like, why has this happened? The number one reason the Tigers are depleting is the incredible increasing population of humans and their need to absorb resources. That's really what it is. The world is slowly taking the biomass that exists and makes the planet breathe and be it, its operating natural state. We're converting the biomass into human mass. There's so many of us. We're heading for a much larger population. England's got one of the great examples of it right now. Y'all are trapped on, on an island, and your population is expanding mm -hmm. ever faster. I look um, at the teachings there that are being given out by Sir David Attenborough um, through Op Optimum Population Trust about what is going to happen because you're one of the test sites of a population over expansion. Where will you fit when there is a billion people on your island? You know, in terms of these ligas that we've seen in the show, there's, there's a bit of a debate about whether or not that's ethical, whether or not that should have happened. What's your take on this? It's a real long, expansive concept. If you go to ligerliger.com, you could get all the science behind mm -hmm. it. Ligers are a naturally occurring animal. Everyone wants to pretend that hybridization is somehow not part of nature because of some Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden notion mm -hmm. that that's originally how we all must have been, that everything was there. But the dinosaurs were living side by side with dolphins or something. It just doesn't make that much sense, but it holds a special place in our mind. Hybrids existed throughout the world. 17 countries had lion and tiger populations just 100 years ago that lived in overlapping territories. At that time, if you look at the genome, you can clearly see that lions and tigers have genetic material that has flowed back and forth between the two species after they had a common ancestor. Everybody wants to roll back and say, no, no, that's before they diverged. Well, this is in modern time. Mm -hmm. Modern tigers and lions share each other's DNA. Modern snow leopards share modern lion DNA. That is just part of the big cat history. They are all very interconnected. Every lion, tiger, leopard, and jaguar can freely interbreed, and their offspring are not sterile. They can breed multi-generational, and it's happened before. Our giant ligers are incredibly inspiring. You see the undertaker with them, and this is a big dude. Mm. This guy is 6 foot 10, 310, 20 pounds of, you know, spring steel and sex appeal. He's out there with that liger, and he looks like a little kid yeah. standing next to a kitty cat. He just is dwarfed. That liger's 12 feet tall, well over 900 pounds, and he stands over 6 feet tall where his nose is when he's on his hind legs. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely massive. He's incredibly healthy. He's a little bit portly, just like I am. He loves a good meal, but he is able to run 40 miles an hour in a couple of steps, and he's a magnificent guy. You can find it on uh, YouTube, Liger Science on YouTube, Liger Channel on YouTube. You can see how cool they are up close and in person. There was talk on the documentary, uh, well, whether or not it was a documentary is debatable, but there was talk on there about you moving animals on. Um, uh, there was talk about euthanizing the, uh, euthanizing the animals. Is there a point where, you, do, do, do the animals always stay at the end of their life with you? Do you move them on? How do you know when and where do you put them? Like, how, how is this system in place? There are a very small amount of cubs that are born every year. It's greatly exaggerated. Big Cat Rescue, Carol Baskin, who killed her husband, <laughs> says all the time, and I have 200 cubs a year to anybody that will listen. Yeah. This 
require 500 females to do. I have 80 big cats called species mix. And I have this tiny group of cubs that pop along. Three to six cubs are all that's needed to interact with the public. And they get to interact until they're 16 to 20 plus weeks old. I'm open seasonally. So if I have six cubs, I can do an entire season. Twelve would be a windfall. Those 12 cubs mostly all would stay with us their entire life. They also only interact with the public one to two hours a week. We're only open three days a week. We don't have an endless passing around of cubs. It's incredibly well regulated. It's super cool to do, but it's not a free-for-all. It's very structured. The cubs are incredibly important to us. When you're down to 3,000-plus animals, you every single one is essential to save. This is a mistake that's being made where the animal rights people are dictating to zoos about not allowing animals to reproduce. It could well mean the end of tiger. Besides to show up, we have a few. And we have friends. We are in the business for 40 years of being a zoological park. Mm -hmm. We have other zoos that we've met over the years. We have zoos that are accredited by the American Zoo Association, supposedly the gold standard of zoos, by the Zoological Association of America and by the American Association of Zoos. They're all competing clubs. None of them have any real merit or understanding of the big picture of what's going on. They're much more worried about the gate. More people go to zoos than all professional sports events combined. Mm -hmm. There are billions of dollars at stake. People forget the billions that is being made in the zoo industry, mostly by the giant zoos like Bronx Zoo, San Diego, places like that. So as tigers come along, zoos around the world ask me, can I have a cub? I have a waiting list that I can never fulfill. I can always find zoos that are accredited facilities that we have a direct connection with or have, um, through our the accrediting body, have been able to have someone else have a direct connection with, and a few of them get a very few tigers every year. That's all that's necessary. No tigers ever euthanized. No tigers ever put to sleep. It's absolutely unethical, immoral, and unnecessary. They're super valuable. You cannot find a tiger in America. If you Google it right now, I want to buy a tiger. Tiger for sale. You'll find dozens of them for sale on the Internet. It's all a scam. You can probably find Cleopatra's earrings on there, too. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're going to get Cleopatra's earrings. All They'll right. come with a certificate. It's baloney. No one's going to deliver a tiger to you. They're either run out of Nigeria as a scam thing that's going on. Now, I got fabulous Nigerian friends. It's not a, a boon against Nigeria. They're smart and have figured out how to run this, get the money for uh, extra stuff. Or it's run by the animal rights people themselves. It's run by offshoots of PETA, Humane Society of the United States, pretending that there's a sale of these animals. They say in the beginning of the show, there's five to 10,000 tigers in America. We know it's absolutely false. There's not a shred of information that anyone can find any place to back that up. It's just the mantra of the animal extremists. There are 1,200 tigers in America. 50% of them are held by crazy lunatics like Carol Baskin and the other people that are running those ridiculous scam -tuaries. There's nothing sanctuary about that rotten backyard hovel of cages that are pinned together with wire that she's got tigers strapped in with mm -hmm. rotting water bowls and all the stuff we all saw on the show. You know, it's, it's likely that Carol runs a, an organization that is uh, doing good for tigers um, as it is that she didn't put some sardine oil on that husband and let him roll on to the next step. Oh, hey. uh, crazy land. But, but when so, you, when oh, you say, when you, that, sorry to interrupt you, buddy. When, when you, thing, there's a thing that tigers get too old, right? Uh -huh. they, they time out. They never get too old. They're incredible at one day as they are at 1,000 days. That's an animal rights propaganda for some reason that they're no longer useful. Yes, tucking a cub is a tiny, Tiny part of its existence it works for a very short time and it's really cool, but it's not why they exist. They exist to try and save the tiger. They exist because of unprecedentedly important genetics. So, on to, on to Joe Exotic, right? He he aspired to be like you. What was it like to just hear that when you were watching this? That someone idolized you like that? Everybody in the big cat world wishes they had a facility like us. We have had the incredible opportunity 
given to us where we made a whole lot of money and have had a whole lot of time. And I have a vision for how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And tens of millions of dollars later, we were able to build this incredible facility. People wish to emulate it. They want to do it on a dime. They think there's a cheaper way to do it. They're going to they're gonna hire some flashier, simpler way to do it, and it's just not true. And Joe wanted to build this, but he didn't have the opportunity and circumstances to do it. He didn't have the vision. He always talked to me saying, what can I do to improve my place? How can we make it work? I gave him advice as I do zoos around the world who contact me. I have zoos in Turkey. I have zoos in Mexico. I have zoos across the United States always asking me for advice in how they can build a better facility that will make the animals and the people connect and have a better time. So Joe said those things to me. Joe was exposed to us. He had a job in this town of Myrtle Beach. 20 million people a year come to Myrtle Beach. There's a lot of tourist action here. Mm -hmm. Joe got a part-time gig doing a magic show for another musician, not himself, to have a tiger there. Problems came up where the tiger was living, how it was being cared for, what was happening. And I intervened trying to make it better. I had to talk with Joe and some of his guys there and try and fix it. So I got to know him a little bit better there. I don't really have a real relationship with him, but that exchange of ideas that um, he was hoping to implement didn't happen. He got obsessed with Carol. Joe became so obsessed with Carol, it kind of took over everything else in his life. Started out with quite a bit of money with quite a bit of high ideals, but he kind of fell off the deep end chasing Carol, and then it really fell off the deep end, but he got involved with Snitch, Jeff Lowe, and James Garrett. Those rotten characters came in and siphoned his life off and then led him down the path of entrapment that he could do this murder-for-hire gig, and I think they dropped him into that, which in the United States is actually illegal, and you're not supposed to go to jail for that. I don't know the whole ins and outs of it. I'm not saying Joe's innocent, but I know for sure it can't be that those guys are innocent, in my opinion. They've got to be doing something else a whole lot wrong. They made a deal, put Joe in jail, we won't have to go to jail, and that's just not how the system's supposed to work. What did you think about the other charges, the euthanasia of the Tigers? Like, obviously, you said that doesn't happen. Joe admitted to doing it himself. Were you, what were you reacting like as you were watching him admit to that? Joe's a fool. He didn't have the right circumstances. He did not understand. Joe is collecting tigers from all across the country, big adults, random hilly-nilly going around just gathering so much. At 270-some tigers there, it's impossible to properly care for them. He's feeding them out of the back of the bad meat truck at Walmart. Mm. That's just crazy land. Obviously, his resources are tapped at that point. Everything here is restaurant quality food that you would glad to eat yourself. We would never present a tiger with something like that. All of that creates health troubles. He had tigers that were doing poorly. He had a lot of trouble with all of that going along, and he made terrible choices by deciding to pick and choose life and death for animals that he really was responsible for and needed to keep under his care. So it's a fool doing a fool's errand. You wish it didn't happen, and I wish he would have asked me before he made such a stupid decision. But that kind of stuff just rolls up. Uh, he wasn't euthanizing tiger cubs. That's an animal rights story. That a tiger cub has a timeout. It grows to a certain point. It's too big. It'll bite your fingers off, which is just absurd. A 50-pound tiger is not even near as dangerous as a Rottweiler. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not near the power of a big dog. But they want you to keep this notion that tiger cubs have to have a home. There are no places in America adopting tiger cubs because they've been lost to photo ops. That's all a big propaganda machine that they're running. So it's also they're cute and cuddly, and they want you to think of that when they think of what he did. From the pictures I've seen, because my information is through the story, there are big adult tigers that were killed. They were euthanized in Joe's idea. He killed them. How he killed them may have been inhumane. He killed them off. Now, it's not that zoos in america and certainly in england certainly in the netherlands they they euthanized that big giraffe do you remember that crazy story from mm -hmm. last year i think that's when it was maybe mm -hmm. the year before <laughs> euthanizing animals at a zoo does happen it is something that goes on we have the room in the space to not have to do that zoos are all the time have one box that they keep tigers in that exhibit is it 
another one comes in, they have nowhere to put that tiger. So they may euthanize him, and it happens in America, but Joe is the only person ever prosecuted for it. If you put euthanized Tiger Zoo in America, I'm sure it could come up a hundred times. None of them were prosecuted. No one even would consider, but Joe was. Joe might have done it more heinously. Joe might be more of a scumbag in some capacity, but he didn't do anything to be prosecuted for to go to prison like that. It could be morally or It it felt to me. Sorry, it felt to me, buddy, like uh, the, the, the evidence they had was so weak on the other charges that they thought the only way we're going to get this done is if we slap as much on him as possible and hope that sinks him. I believe you're absolutely correct. The murder for hire was so weak. They hired the maintenance man that's Jeff Lowe's full-time buddy mm-hmm. and say, hey, by the way, this guy's a part-time hitman and he'll give you an international traveling hitman uh, professional advice for three thousand oh. dollars. Who the hell is that? I don't think you could get it done for a hundred thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. You would be dealing with a new friend's advice on how to kill your enemies. The whole thing is absurd. And I think when Joe fell into it, because Jeff and James Garrison were whispering in his ear just ridiculous lies, flying him with drugs and opportunity, and and blowing smoke up his ass that there was going to be some new shiny world they were going to offer him when all they wanted to do was siphon out his wealth, kick him to the curb, which is where he was when they found him. He'd abandoned the zoo. He's, I think he was tending bar, they say, in the middle of nowhere, Florida. His, his life had become a shambles. And previous to meeting those characters, everything looked pretty rosy still, except his war with Carol, which was... For him, pretty entertaining. For some of us, you know, Here Kitty Kitty is a hell of a story. <laughs> that song. That song that, was that song, so that funny. Video. Man. Wow. Um, the, 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 one of the sad moments from Joe's side was when he gave ownership over to his mother and basically it, it seemed to render her bankrupt almost at the end there. What, what did you make of that situation? I think it was a tragic situation. I think his mother was his greatest supporter. I think he had a great relationship going with his parents. Mm -hmm. They were there with him throughout the whole thing. I think that his relationship with Jeff Lowe helped to make that whole thing crumble. And it seemed that they siphoned off the wealth. In my opinion, Joe went from uh, riches to rags, Mm -hmm. and he was helped all along the way. And other people rose up while Joe fell down. On to Carol Baskin. Now, um, you've mentioned your beliefs uh, seem to align with a lot of people's beliefs right now. Has she ever come after you? Like, have you ever met this woman? Has she? Because she was definitely mentioning you and saying things about you. Come on. I am the Ritz-Carlton of Big Cats. I am Carol's biggest nemesis. <laughs> Joe stepped into the limelight because he was fool enough to take the bait, uh-huh. and he was running a shoddy set up. It just wasn't working out well for the animals. Yeah. You know, and he allowed himself to just make terrible choices for how humane the place was being run. He never could find good staff. You know, I have incredible staff that have been here, a lot of them for decades, and couldn't put it together, and the place looked like shit. It wasn't going well. Mm-hmm. Carol switched gears and went after him because he went after her. He couldn't take the challenge. Carol's been attacking me as soon as she went from, hey, um, I'm this cool cat and kitten selling you a tiger, how to raise a tiger, want to buy a tiger. She was the salesman that she's saying everybody else is uh, wrong for doing. She was buying snow leopards and trying to import cheetahs from Africa. She was so bent on having the greatest collection of big cats in the world, but she never came close to, and that's what we absolutely have here. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing collection. And she went off the rails, and she came after me with a vengeance before Joe ever petted his first little cub, she was on me. She's always chased me down for that stuff, but it's never mattered because she's just a lying, cheating fool for those accusations. And everybody, since I knew who she was, said every day, anytime Carol came up, because every cat person in America hates her guts, they said, we all know she killed her husband. That's the mantra of the industry long before Tiger King. And I talked with a woman who told me herself, in her opinion, that when Carol killed Don, they held a gun to her head and they had her sign the will with a gun to her head. She testified to it in court or in a 
in a, a police report. Mm -hmm. She testified to it, and it just never went anywhere. Well, have, have you have you heard? Have, have you heard about the fact that the signatures don't match up? Um, so Don's signatures on everything else are consistent, but on that document that you've just me mentioned there, where he said that if I disappear, uh, you, it goes to Carol, her, the signature is a completely different signature. It doesn't even That's match up. And yet, and yet they just process this. All right, five years, he's dead. The kids get nothing. I mean, Carol is ruthless. You got to give her that. And that, if that bitch falls up behind you with a can of sardine oil, you better start hoofing it. <laughs> She's looking for trouble. So you, you believe she killed her husband then? I watched the show. I've heard the tales forever. I believe she did. I believe the lady that I've known for years that said a gun was held on her and she was forced to sign that document as a witness. I think that it's been that way. Everyone knew and it just kept disappearing. I think Tiger King's only good moment is that they put the spotlight on this rancid bitch and that people understand who she is. And all you really needed was good video of her because you can see she's crazy as a loon running around, yeah. flowers in her hair, talking crazy talk, talking about the enormous wealth she's accumulated come from donations on her tax forms, which you can see on bcrwatch.com. Her tax forms clearly say she's making more than $4 million a year. This lady's raked it in. You take the money that she's made plus that, we're talking tens of millions of dollars in income. Everybody works for free. The veterinarians are free. She's got free legal uh, counsel going on. Man, this lady's crazy. On BCR Watch, it says that she owns over 90 homes in that area. She is a landlord extraordinaire. And what do you think happens if those people don't pay their rent? Oh, yeah, exactly. And we, we've had, um, in this country, we've had uh, body language experts analyzing the way she says, um, I never threatened him. And you see in that moment where she says, I never threatened him, her mouth does something very strange at the end. And we, they've, they've really got her under the spotlight, like you're saying. And it seems to me like one of the things about this woman is adulation. Uh, she admits she, she grew up without friends. She had imaginary cats as friends. She didn't have normal relationships with people. And we all know people who kill people, that's how it always starts. Now, I'm not saying she did, but it's, it's an indicator. And then we've got um, the point now where the spotlight is on her. And it just makes you wonder if she's craved everyone to love her all those years and now she's sending her husband out to do this video on her behalf because she can't even face the camera at the moment for the scrutiny that to me it doesn't speak of an innocence you know i agree 100 percent. she just looks like she's fallen off the edge the brand of carol baskin big cat rescue which has always been just a joke 12 cats there mm -hmm. that whole brand has taken a horrible hit and you're talking about a brand that makes millions and millions of dollars every year. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful brand. And not just does it make that money. They throw lavish parties all the time. They have big, expensive weddings. They, get, they have all these car dealerships that sponsor them and people that just are constantly giving her this big boost. And the other crazy humaniacs that are out there, Humane Society, PETA, mm -hmm. other big cat places, lunatics out, out there in Los Angeles, Tippy Hedren, who runs another big cat rescue sim system called Shambhala. The other people in Minnesota that run theirs that are her buddies, silent. Mm. None of them are jumping on the bandwagon. They haven't asked to be on your program, I bet, to tell you <laughs> why they love Carol and understand her. And those cans of sardine oil have nothing to do with the murder. Yeah. No one's out there helping. Yeah, I did think when I watched her husband defend her and he goes, um, I've never had an argument with that. I thought, you're not helping things here, mate. You're really not helping this. What the fuck that? I mean, in 25 years, you've never argued. I'm not buying it. And, and if you haven't, there's, some, there's a reason you're scared, you know? Come on. You're going to argue over what's being ordered for dinner if you go to a restaurant or you're yeah. not in love. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's just how it's going to be. So uh, one, one of the things we noticed was your love life was brought up obviously in this show and um you know some people saying he's got nine wives three wives four wives five wives how, how's that been because you've been under some scrutiny yourself and it, what what is the situation what is the truth 
the truth is, 25 years ago was the last time I was married. I was married to a lovely lady who died in a car crash here in Myrtle Beach. She's the father of, excuse me, she's the mother of Cody okay. and uh, my daughter Tawny, my youngest kids, who mm-hmm. are 30 and 25 years old. Mm-hmm. She's their mom. Now, that lady has gone out of my life, and I have been dating ever since. You know, it's something that I do. Yes, I'm running around. I, I have girls that I have spent time with. I've got more than one girlfriend at a time, and they know who each other are. Yeah. They know I am the character that I am, and they're cool with it. Why the hell is everybody else got to have an opinion? They're pretending that they are young. These are girls that are 40 and 50 years old. Yeah. These aren't children. It's all this idea of these all these young girls. Only girls were shown in the special. Uh-huh. Half of my staff are male. Uh-huh. And they're out there saying, look at all these girls. That is my granddaughter. That is my niece. That is my nephew's significant other. That's my son Cody's girlfriend. That is other characters that are married and have uh, life partners here. The young girls are all those guys' connection to those women. None of those have a relationship with me. I am the boss. I am there. Those girls are all intimately connected to my family. And then it is my family. My two big, beautiful daughters are the the bright, shining beauty queens here at the facility. People all the time, because they come up, they hug me, they got my arm around me. And now with Tiger King, they're like, that must be one of those girls. Like, daughter, fool. I mean, it's silly. I have not married, and I live alone in my own house, and I have had visitors on (laughs) some pretty regular occasions. My guy, I appreciate that and I respect that. And I, what I want to ask if this is okay, I've known men in my life who, when they have lost the love of their life, uh, they don't try and replace that. They go and say, you know, I had that person and now I'm going to try and enjoy life while it's here, but no one will ever be her. And, and was there a, a bit of that in your mind as you move forward with your life? Certainly in the beginning, because this is 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, certainly, I have this incredible girl. She helped me build and run and help my whole facility operate, and it was tragic to, to lose her. Mm-hmm. But the process um, throughout my life has been that I have regrouped and moved on through life's uh, good, bad, and ugly things. I mm-hmm. hope I survived Tiger King, because it's all of those at once <laughs> as well. Oh. You know, and, and, I, and I am... I love girls. I chase girls. I love adult girls with a powerful mindset. My girls stand toe-to-toe with adult lions and tigers and are happy to say, we're going this way. Let's go. Mm -hmm. These are powerful women who, in their own right, make this entire facility operate, who spend an incredible amount of time with wildlife, and that takes a very powerful mindset. That's also the simple reflection that the silly little girl, Barbara Fisher, who popped up and said, oh, I was there, was a part-time babysitter nanny Mm -hmm, and visited mm -hmm. us, hung around for a few months, babysat my daughter, did a show with me, fell in love with a guy that jousted on horseback, you know, like old night tales, got pregnant and moved away with that dude. A year later, she shows back up and says, yeah, I didn't have the baby. I want to come back. Can I just help you watch the kids again? I said, sure, come on. I traveled off to Africa. I had incredible adventures there. I have since I was a kid. I had to go to Thailand and work on a tiger conservation program. I went off to Las Vegas, to the Bahamas, doing all this work. I took her with me because I took my kids with me. And I took my significant other girlfriends with me, the same ones that are still here. I took them with me, and they helped watch over the stuff as well. And then she came back to the States with me. One of the African guys comes back and stays with me, and she says, I'll marry you and give you a visa. He says, yippee. They're hanging <laughs> out together. She gets pregnant again. Oh, fuck. I was like, man, I don't want no dang baby. And he's like, I like this other girl just as well. Casey Kim, the other girl. Barbara's there going, no, me. He fights with Kim. They start slugging each other. They're spitting and hissing like crazy women. She's prego. She runs off again. I don't see her for another year. She calls me and says, I want to be a chef. Help me be a chef, and I'll, I'll come back and cook for you. I said, well, we always need a cook. I send her money. I put her through chef school. She fails out of chef school at <laughs> some point sometime. Comes back. She says, oh, I'm pregnant again. I'm marrying this new dude. I want to come help you for the summer. 
and take pictures and help with taking care of some cubs and well, I'll watch kids again. I said, yippee, come on. We need somebody to watch it. The kids love the girl. She's a big kid herself. She comes. She just stays a couple months. She doesn't fulfill her contract. She runs off again. She calls me all the time for years, for 10 more years. Calls, I want to come see you. I want to come hang out again. I want to bring my kids that I've kept now, and I want to interact. I want to do something. And we shined her saying, nope, you're not welcome. We don't really want you. You know, you're kind of a psychopath. You're really a psychopath. No, you're a fucking psychopath. And we don't let her come back. She so, starts so, writing bullshit. Is this, the, is this the girl in the documentary who claims all of these things? Okay. This is Barbara Fisher in the okay. documentary. I should have been clearer in the beginning. Not cool. The name, mm -hmm. It's there. Barbara Fisher runs through this whole insanity with me. It all develops up. He runs through this gambit of coming and going, coming and going. And she's gone. She writes the salacious stories about me and stuff. Never gets any real press. Then the Tiger King people see some of it. And they think, wow, this is the story we'll latch on to. They interview 16 women. They talk to all of them. They ask every one of them salacious bullshit. Oh, are, have you been sexually compromised? Is Doc chasing you? They all say, of course not. Nothing works out. The girl that they've got putting on the makeup and being so pretty, that's, one of, that's my friend, Dr. Robert Johnson, the teacher here at the university. That girl helps us run our shows and takes care of animals with us. That's his fiance. Insinuating she's in the harem. She's living <laughs> in the tent with the rest of these kids. Locked in, you know, with a big yeah. guard with a sword or something. Uh -huh. It's all just some crazy land just to, because they could. Why are 16 chicks interviewed? One made it on there. They paid 10000 bucks for these interviews. Now, none of them said the right thing. They went all over the country, found all my old staff. I had 350 of these kids work for me, male and female, of course, 50-50 probably. And none of them had anything bad to say. There's not another soul in the documentary. No, you, you're That's totally right, though. This, this is the thing. I, I, as the interviewer, it's my job to sort of challenge you. But no. now you're saying this, I, I, it just sparked in my head. Like, none of your um, you know, current staff were given even a minute, half a minute, nothing. None of it was in there. Nothing. And you'd assume they would ask them a fucking question. They, they interviewed them for days. <laughs> Every one of them sat in the hot seat and got talked to for days. They love it here. Any of them, most people who come and get a solid foot here yeah. never leave. That's the norm here unless they've got some tragedy in their life or unless they marry somebody outside the group. We've had some really great staff who've gotten married and moved away. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's just happened. I had a, a kid from Israel here who is just such a strong character, helped so much. His name is Shavit. He married one of the girls. She wasn't hip to the note of being here. He moves away. I lost a ton of guys because of that. But all the staff were interviewed, and there are half men here. They interviewed none of the men. Of course, they talked to all of them for hours as well. Not a, they don't even take a snapshot of them. They do every girl, because a lot of them are good-looking mm -hmm. girls, they do every girl. They take them from every angle. They're clapping their hands. They fucking show them on Halloween, dressed up in weird clothes, and they don't tell you it's Halloween. <laughs> These girls don't dress like that. They're wearing this other outrageous yeah. clothing, and that bitch is on there talking, saying, hey, he made us dress in funny clothes. He made us act sexual. They're up there being like Halloween crazy. They're allowed to party and drink and goof around, and they videotape that. And don't tell you that's what's happening. Uh, that little girl's got whiskers drawn on her lips. Think I'm making the chicks wear whiskers in the yeah. day? That it's Halloween. Yeah. So yeah, to the audience, it was as if it was like you, your son, and just a whole load of women who apparently have been made or forced to change their names. Uh, well, yes, exactly. Is, is this is this this name changing thing? Is that something you just do for fun, or is there any reason, or is that not even true? What's the score? I am the master of all nicknames. Cool. The gentleman who was just looking at you on the thing, his name's Nick. Okay. He's who helped me set up this stuff. His name is Patty Whack. <laughs> and I've been calling him Patty and Patty Whack all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it's just what I do. I, I always use nicknames and they stick. And they stick over time. I also think that nicknames help people to like be here quicker, to not mistake who else is being called. 
for God forbid I have two guys named Rob at one time. I'm going to start calling one of them anything else but Rob because mm-hmm. I can't have them both come. I have a beautiful big lion named Arthur, and Arthur was my lion guy. I had a dude come in, hard working, good guy. His damn name's Arthur. I said, fuck that. You cannot be Arthur. <laughs> Your name is Thor. Uh-huh. And they're like, why does he call you Thor? He's got some problem with Greek mythology or I mean, Norse mythology. I'm like, I can't call him the lion's name. That's why he's named Thor. And I think he's kept it to this day. Yeah. Because it's pretty cool to be Thor. Yeah, it's a cool name. Thor. It's a cool name. But one, one, so just to cover off what this woman said, just to give you your fair shot so people know this, I've asked this. She was yeah, saying yeah. boob jobs, cockroaches, um, any of yeah, that. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> boob so jobs boob and cockroaches. Jobs. Boob jobs. In the United States, if you go to a board-certified surgeon and you say, hey, I want some boobs, you got to go in and have three in-depth meetings. This girl went to a, a guy that we know well that has sewed up my nose when a leopard knocked it off. He has sewed up Cody's chin. Cody went and got the gigantic gauge earrings. Looks like you're the guy that might have those. Mm-hmm. Got those big earrings, and those, he, he stitched them back down. He's just a guy. He met Barbara Fisher, she interviewed with him as is necessary. You have to hold the boobs in your hands. You got to measure them. You got to take photographs. You got to have the photos, do a comparison chart. Not simple. Go get a good boob job in America. She goes through all that. She can't pay for them, so she has to finance them. That girl made boob job payments for five years, maybe longer. I don't even know. because She was obsessed with having boobs. Those boobs didn't live here. She's living out there, test driving them on every Tom, Dick, and Harry she can find. <laughs> that's why she's pregnant all the time. Oh, fuck. And that's the only boob thing that happens, you know? It's mm-hmm. just ridiculous. She says that that's like something that was part of the game that had to happen here. Cockroaches. This is a USDA licensed facility. We have unannounced inspections that happen here three to four times a year by federal veterinarians. This is an essential thing to maintain your license. It's a good thing. You show up all the time. For us, smooth sailing. If you're a crappy place, that's what puts pressure on you to either be good or get out of the game. These people come. Almost all of them are women. They come and check everything. They white glove test stuff. You know, they're looking for every little nuance. And if you have cockroaches, you're going down. You can't have cockroaches running around. You've got to have surfaces clean. You've got to have refrigerators that are spotless. If you had a single bag, a loaf of bread that had a cockroach in it, they would write you up. You got written up twice. It's 10000 bucks for each occurrence like that. If you got write, written up regularly, they'll take your license. You look at those other characters in the show, that outrageous guy, Tim Stark, that's saying wild stuff. He's also crazy about girls. And, and he's somehow connecting his craziness with mine. It's absolutely opposite. He's there. He's got his permit taken away from him. No, got his permit taken away from him. There's another big place called Dade City that's been under the gun with Joe and part of the big lawsuit that's happened here in the States. His permit's taken away. Her permit. Jeff Lowe is right now. They're trying to take his permit away. He will lose that zoo. Mark my words. That place will go down. I'm quite happy about that because um, Jeff Lowe sounds like an asshole. Oh, such a little douche. You know, first thing is, man, he's short. He's got a massive ego. <laughs> and he's had nothing but trouble in his entire life. He's a, he's a full-time con man. So anyway, back to cockroaches. You can't have bugs. You can't have uh, a single mouse bird will mm-hmm. be written up. If you have a bowl that's turned upside down, it's clean. If it's upright and a mouse ran through it, if you saw a footprint or a turd in there... Right there, man, that's a violation. Twice, that's 10000 bucks. You can't do these things. She's making outrageous statements that, of course, can't be true. There's federal reports that anyone can read to say that the place is spotless and an amazing facility. All right, I haven't got too many more questions. I do appreciate your time. Right. is valuable, buddy. Um, did you see Donald Trump on the news saying he is going to look into Joy Exotic? All right, crazy land. Hey, it's, it's phenomenal that anything makes it all the way from Netflix to the president's ears. I think it's because one of his kids has been watching the show mm-hmm. and got riled up about it and probably didn't tell dad but told some reporter or something, mm-hmm. what are you doing today sitting up? I'm watching Tiger King. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I heard that um, 
uh, Kim Kardashian and her husband there um, are trying to get Joe a pardon from the president. That also I saw pop up on a feed. Uh, I don't know the truth of it, but it's it's kind of crazy land. I can't imagine that will happen. I would I think that Joe could potentially get a new trial to happen, mm -hmm. that he could get an appeal. I think that that's probably a good thing, that he would have an appeal come up so that the facts could be presented more clearly. Mm -hmm. I think that him uh, having an attorney that only was working for him on for free, you know, the, the appointed attorney, is really difficult. If Joe Exotic had O.J. Simpson's legal team, Joe would be walking around today singing, I had a tiger. <laughs> you know, I was so devastated when I realized he didn't actually sing all those fucking songs. I'm not sure that's true. Those guys are bums as well. <laughs> he obviously had a contract with them. Yeah. So if they did sing, they sang harmony or backup. I've heard Joe sing a little bit. It, he's not a bad singer. Yeah. You, if you can just barely carry a tune and they synthesize you, it can roll out. I'm not sure those aren't bums just jumping on the wagon. I, I bet they have something to do with it, but Joe's not the end. Uh, he's not a bad singer, and there's some bad singers that have had some hit songs. You know, how, how can we ever forget Vanilla Ice? Oh, mate, the, the, the one that Carol Baskin had made, that music video she had made, where him and her husband are sitting on the couch, and this husband, he's like, just shoot me now. Like, it was terrible, that. I'd rather be dead than listen to that shit. Um, do, you, do you think you will see Joe Exotic as a free man? If you had to put money on it, where would you go? If I had to put money on it, I think that it's 50-50 Joe could get out. So mm. I'd be a little afraid to take the bet. I might, I might throw a 1,000 at 10 to 1 odds okay. he's going to get out. You know, I wouldn't go a straight up bet on it okay. because there's too much bullshit that's happened. And I think entrapment is there, and I think that he faced char wildlife charges that many other people have committed the same crime, and they always look the other way. If a lemur at the zoo, loses an arm because it gets cancer and its arm falls off and it's dying of cancer, the veterinarians don't wait for the lemur to die suffering. They euthanize it. Mm -hmm. They're saying in Joe's trial, as I understand it, that the euthanasia of any tiger is a crime at any time. So that sounds to me like it's contrived to make Joe look worse to the jury who didn't know the insanity of the Carol Baskin drama and try to put him in a predicament where they could make him appear to be a bad, bad guy. Not that he didn't do bad, bad things, but I don't know if he did 22 years worth and OJ's out, so I don't know how this all works, really. I do Good feel I, I feel like the guy, because he was flapping his gums and telling everyone how he's going to do this to Carol and that to Carol. If anything, that makes me more inclined to think he would never have done it it was just all bullshit and he was just trying to intimidate her um but on the carol do you think she could potentially they could switch roles maybe or even do you think anything will come of this with carol do you think she could end up in a cage i think it's possible that they could pull up circumstantial evidence that makes her be looked at yeah. but i don't know without a body if it's possible yeah. in the u.s nobody and a murder charge is very hard to connect together. You'd have to have the hitman that helped her testify saying, I was paid, here's the proof. Now, his wife, supposedly, has come forward. That's also on PCR.com. His wife came forward and put a letter out that said, I'm the hitman's wife. This is when he did it. This is how much she paid him. And she allured to that same thing because he was paid in guns and with a van. And she said, unsolicited, this dude, Don Doe, he had a butt, got all of Don's guns and got Don's van. And Don disappeared in Costa Rica. And uh, the whole thing looks really messy. Maybe something like that could happen. But I can't see how that hitman's freshly out of prison, I've been told. He doesn't want to go back. So why would he uh, indicate himself unless they gave him a deal mm. like they uh, Jeff Lowe and said, hey, you put Carol in jail, you can do it. Well, that would be Tiger King 2 that would be watching right oh, there. That is, that's the script right there. You've written it. Um, yeah. One, uh, three questions left. 
they're talking about making this into a movie. I was just wondering who you would have play you if there's anyone who stands out. If they're going to make Tiger King, the ridiculous, sensationalized, lion cheating comedy, into a movie, then I got to be played by Will Ferrell. Oh, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Pull it off. <laughs> Nailed you know, it. You might have to get down, but I mean, that dude, he looks a little bit like me, you know? Yeah. He, he chops where he could keep the comedy rolling because how can Tiger King be anything but a comedy? This is outrageous stuff. It's not about the truth. There's no such thing as 5,000 tigers lost in America. It's all a lie. I think all of that's coming closer and closer to coming out. You know, I, I think you could have the flamboyant Joe and psychotic Carol balancing back and forth. But I'm not sure it's a movie. I'm not sure that, it, you know, you can in 90 minutes you can tell a good enough tale mm. of that. But, you know, the right script, you could talk about a freaking manufacturer of tires and make it interesting. So... I'll see where it goes. There's there's a lot of people who um, seem to think that your job is glamorous and easy and fun. But I was just wondering, and, and not necessarily in the way that some people might think, but is there any parts of your job, because you're working with animals and, you know, naturally we love animals, that you feel um, like are really difficult that no one would know about? Or, or maybe you feel a little bit of guilt, like, oh, like I can't believe I had to do that a day. Or is there anything where, that people wouldn't know about? This is running an agricultural operation, right? This, this is a job that starts as the sun comes up or in the right time of year, well before the sun comes up. This is a job that happens way after the sun sets. It never ends. Seven days a week, 18 hours a day, there are wildlife in your care that you must be watching over. Without that very specific relationship, you're not doing to them the proper service that you really need to to run a quality establishment. Nine to five animal care is BS. It will not work. This job is so long and so odious. It's why so many people don't actually stick. If they start thinking, I'm going to take care of animals, and they go, oh, my God, my entire life. I don't go out. I don't go places. I only go on conservation missions if I'm vacationing. That's the only thing I try to go and, and work on and do is go off to Africa, go off to Indonesia, and check on that kind of work. It is my whole life. And that people don't understand. I know people think, well, it's okay, it's with animals. They don't understand how intense that is. Mm -hmm. And there's also an endless piece of stress. I have these incredible kids that are eternally two years old. They're there, and they don't quite get how to behave except these guys have machine guns and if they get out they can kill somebody and tear some stuff up you've got this massive responsibility round the clock to keep an eyeball on them and make sure it's there also people say oh it's so easy you know all you do is hang out with animals i have a giant chimpanzee as big as me it's with me every night for dinner <laughs> i love it dude. he's cool but he's there. My son Cody's got another giant chimpanzee sitting next to him at dinner. Every night, those boys are going to knock back 5,000 calories, and then they're going to peel some oranges and, and fling the peel, you know, and they're going to be wild and crazy boys. It's an enormous commitment to what we do that can't be understood unless you've lived you mentioned guns there. I just remembered you sleep with an AK-47, apparently, according to this show. Uh, why do you sleep with that gun? <laughs> I am the, in charge. I'm in charge of this incredible facility here that has 80 big cats there going along. I have all those huge primates going along. If something tragic starts to take place, a weapon is a needed piece of the work that we do. I, my life is threatened every day, one to 50 times. People say they want to kill me, going to kill me, going to get me. Because of Carol Baskin, mm -hmm. the salacious insanity that she's written, all of the stuff she said, I'm this evil dude, people think that there's something there. I don't know where the next crazy person is going to go. I'm a professional cowboy. I grew up with a six gun on my hip when I was 10 years old. So did my dad. That's how we live, and that's what I've done. That's the Wild West that I grew up in. 
So I always have high-end semi-automatic weapons surrounding me. I also have a variety of another 50 guns in my life. I have a pistol in my pocket. I have one in my glove box. I travel like that all the time. We have concealed weapon permits, and we carry guns when we're doing things as a possibility of last result. I've never had to shoot an animal. I don't ever think I will have to shoot an animal. But the, the potential is there. I have shot many different times in the air because one tiger is attacking another tiger, and they won't separate. And get, I've come next to them and fired in the air before, fired in the dirt next to my feet to create the shock and awe to get them to stop trying to kill each other. It's very rare. In a 40-year career, it's happened three times maybe in my 40-year career. Probably not in the last decade, but I'm not going to be unprepared. Better to have a gun and never need it than need a gun and never had it. Never a trail word spoken there. Um, last question. I like to ask this to all our guests. How would you like to be remembered? Hey, there's one more crazy thing at the end. They roll up the screen at Tiger King and they say, Doc Enter's facility was just raided. Complete bullshit. You're swearing okay on your show? Oh, you can say whatever the fuck you like, my friend. Oh, there you go. Okay. At the end of the show, up rolls that screen. It says, Doc Animal's facility was raided. That's total bullshit. It never happened. There was a team of veterinarians that came with the state's attorney's office in Virginia for a zoo that had been closed down in Virginia. I don't know the details of it. It seems a little fishy how they closed it. But it was closed down by animal activists and by animal rightsy people and the state's attorney somehow. They wanted to find out where three lions went, the guy no longer claimed to have. Now, this guy did a federal exchange with me. He had three lions. He called me, said, I cannot take care of them. I'd be happy for you to have them. I know you'll provide them a great home. My daughter got in a car, drived up, picked up those three lions, and brought them back to our home. They've been here ever since. Those lions were registered on our federal paperwork. Those lions had a statewide travel permit. Those lions are registered and inspected already twice by the U.S. Department of Agricultural Federal Veterinarians. It was all in the open. They came and said, no, no, we have to test the DNA because you might say they're not yours, and you might say it's different lines. I said, here's a federal document. Take it. Take a picture. No, no. So we did these DNA tests. They asked for more documents. They wanted them if there's anything else we had. Let us, we gave them access to every place there was a file to say, there's nothing here. They got on their merry way and went back to Virginia. I will probably never hear from them again. I was in no way seen to have any wrongdoing. I did nothing. We were sure as hell never raided. If you are raided in America and they're going out for criminal charges, it's all over the Internet. The moment it goes out, it's a public piece of understanding. If you're arrested, if you're being claimed to uh, be part of a crime, even if you're bailed out or whatever, it's public record. There's none of that because it's absolutely not true. No, I, I appreciate that, and I'm glad you cleared that up because uh, you know a lot of people kind of would have been left with an impression of you after that, which isn't fair. Um, so how would you well, like to be remembered? If I was looking to be remembered in one way, it would be that we made a substantial contribution to saving the tiger. The tiger stands as the last great sentinel of the forest. I believe that if we lose him, we'll lose a piece of ourselves forever. I think by, by saving the tiger, we can save the world. I think the world is under enormous pressure, and this incredible character of the tiger helps us to all feel better that he's out there in the wild and that he's there taking care as this overlord for all things mystical, wild, and fabulous. I hope to save him. I hope we can make it that future generations always have the tiger and can see him. And I hope I can be remembered for that one thing. That would be my proudest moment. Doc Antle, it has been a pleasure, mate. Thank you for coming on. And uh, I, hope, I hope we can do this again sometime, buddy. And really, nothing would be as impactful as if you came and visited me here. Come here. I've got this incredible place on the waterfront down here, a beautiful big place for celebrities and people to stay at. Come and do some broadcasts from there. 
Let me have a giant chimp in your lap. Meet Jesus. my big tigers. Swim in a pool. Do that stuff. You would understand animals in a way that you could not imagine if you got to spend time with us. And it'd be a blast to do. So roll on over and see us. It's a simple flight. I've done it a ton. You can just make it to Myrtle Beach and immerse yourself in lions and tigers and bears, hug an elephant, kiss a baby yeah. cub. It'll never leave you. I've got a tattoo of a lion on my arm, actually, so maybe I could get a, p a picture with it out, you know, next to an actual lion. That would be good. <laughs> um, so thanks again. And uh, obviously, we'll put all your socials in the description so people can go and check out everything you're doing. Okay, thanks, guys. Hope you've enjoyed the podcast, and we'll see you later.